A number of years ago, I had the chance to travel to uh, Louisiana State Penitentiary, the largest maximum security prison in our country. I went with a, a couple of men from our church, a number of men actually, and before that trip, we went to, um, actually it was a, a, a ministry to dads in the prison, helping them uh, understand the love of their fa Heavenly Father and be the fathers on the inside that they were never able to be on the outside. Remarkable trip and remarkable experience. Uh, uh, the prison's named Angola, nicknamed Angola, for the region from which in Africa the slaves came who worked that land in the pre-Civil War area um, as a plantation. It's 6, 000, uh, 18,000 acres, 6,000 inmates. It's bigger than Manhattan Island. Um, it's on an oxbow of the Mississippi River. It's a massive uh, place, and most of the men there are doing 80 years or more. Mo many, it has the largest number of inmates who are doing life without possibility of parole. Um, and prior to my trip with some men from the church, I went with, on a prayer trip to pray about this event ahead of time. So I got to go there and meet with inmate pastors. I know that might sound strange to you, but these are men who came to faith in Christ in the prison, were educated in the prison. Louisiana uh, Baptist Seminary has a Bible college in the prison. These men came to faith in Jesus and were trained as pastors in prison. One of the men said to me, and I've shared this before, he said, I, I was devastated to find out that when I came to faith in Jesus that I could never get out to share his love with other people. And then I realized... I don't have to because they keep bringing them in. So his mission is to be the first guy that they meet when they get off the bus. So this is not the end of your life. It can be the beginning. These five men, remarkable men, taught me more about what it means to be free in Christ, and they're incarcerated for life. Anyway, we walked throughout the prison grounds praying for the event that was going to happen in about a month. Uh, we walked everywhere. There's six different prison locations in, the, in Angola, uh, and there's, we walked on death row, and we walked in the prison yards, on the walkways, in the rooms where the men slept, in the mess hall, eating, uh, dining area, every, the workshops, uh, the farm, it's a working farm in the farm fields, and everywhere we went, we stopped and prayed, and it was, didn't take long for me to realize these men pray different than I pray. Uh, they just pray different. The primary difference was they were praying like uh, battlefield prayers. And I was praying that God would do certain things. They were praying that, and they were praying that Satan would not do certain things. They were praying against spiritual forces throughout the prison. And I have to be honest, at that time I was a little uncomfortable. I thought, okay, I know that there's real evil in the world, but this is a little over the top. Like there's not a devil behind every rock, is there? But they would pray over the walkway, you know, that Satan would not be able to touch the men walking to eat. They would pray over like the, 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 the dormitories and, and, and that Satan wouldn't, wouldn't touch the men's minds and they would pray against the forces of evil. And I felt a little bit like, Okay, this is overkill. But I think looking back, I know, that said more about my spiritual maturity, or lack thereof, than theirs, that I was uncomfortable with that. These men came to faith in a maximum security prison. To them, this Christian life was a battle. There was a real battle going on. And it wasn't just against other men, or even primarily, on the cell block. I learned uh, so much from those men about grace and redemption in the darkest places and for the most hardened souls. And I also learned about the power of prayer in the Christian's life, and I'm still learning. I don't mean that to be a Christian, you have to see uh, Satan behind every bad thing in your life. There are Christians like this, right? Oh, they took my parking spot, the devil. Right? Like, uh, the stock market's down, oh, Satan. Like, it's, you know, whenever I say that, I think of the church lady, right? Who could it be? I just don't know, Satan, right? We, we shouldn't go through life thinking that every bad thing that happens is the result of some you know, horned guy somewhere. On the other hand, we should not be ignorant about his reality. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Screwtape Letters, if you've never read this, it's a fictitious um, letters between uh, two demons. One is Uncle Screwtape. He's writing to his nephew, uh, Wormwood. Now, I don't believe the demons actually have uncles and nephews, but it's, it's, it's imaginary. I don't even know if they write letters, to be honest with you. But the point is, he's writing to advise his, this younger demon in how to distract, tempt, and mess up the patient, which is the human being's life. How to keep them from being effective in their walk with Christ. In the introduction to this book, he writes, there are two equal and opposite errors into which we can fall in regard to the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence entirely. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And they themselves are equally pleased by both errors. So on the one hand, there's some of us who are like, look, that's not, that's just metaphorical language from an ancient book. There's no real devil. That's an error. The other is to think, Satan's, I'm paralyzed with fear because I see him everywhere. So we should, we should avoid both of these errors. Well, where, where should we land then? As we come to the end of our series in this incredible letter called Ephesians, Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing this letter to Christians in the first century living in the ancient city of Ephesus, 
he wraps up his letter. And if you've not been with us, hey, you could get the app and listen to all the sermons right on the app and catch up. Um, uh, but, but it's been a really a remarkable journey. In my own life, it's been a, a powerful journey just to study what Paul is saying to these Christians. He's, con- he's going to finish his letter by talking about spiritual warfare, the reality of spiritual forces, and what that says to us living today. So if you have your Bible, let's open to uh, Ephesians 6. We can follow on the screens. We'll read verses 10 through 20. Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that the words may be given me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul is telling these Christians in the first century and us in the 21st century that if you make the decision to trust Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you become one of his children, a follower of Christ, you are in a spiritual battle. He doesn't say you're going to have to consider joining one. You might find yourself in a skirmish now and then. He doesn't say you ought to think about getting involved here. He says you're in one. Like it or not, recognize it or not, to follow Christ is to be in a struggle, a battle. This is our real battle, our very real battle. When Paul says we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, that word wrestle is sometimes translated struggle or fight. It's not used to talk about a a massive battle between armies. It's hand-to-hand combat. Last night at home, I watched the real March Madness, the NCAA wrestling championships. (laughs) Anybody else? I figured it was just me, one other guy last hour, right? My wife is watching basketball, my son's watching Netflix, but I'm watching the real March Madness wrestling championships. Just me, and I'm the only guy I know on my whole block. But this, this one-on-one struggle, that's the imagery Paul gives us here. You're in a one-on-one, you're in a, a hand-to-hand combat, a struggle, physical struggle, spiritual battle. Now, he does not mean that we never wrestle against flesh and blood. Paul himself was put in prison, was beaten, was in chains. He had, he had flesh and blood issues, struggles with people. But his, that, his point is not that we never have any struggle with another human being or, or human institution. He's saying fundamentally, primarily, the Christian life is not a battle against them. It's a spiritual battle. There are real powers behind those flesh and blood realities. It's not a culture war. It's not a political struggle. It's not an economic struggle or an educational battle. There are spiritual forces behind those things. Up until roughly 150 years ago, I think most people in our culture believed this, at least in general, that there are real forces of good and evil at work in the world. But what's happened, I think, is we have, in jettisoning jettisoning the biblical worldview, which our culture has, by and large, We have also cut loose the only means by which we could deal with real evil. We've gotten rid of it. In other words, we believe we wrestle only against the flesh and blood. And we can, by economic improvements, social programs, educational improvements, political agendas, we can eventually eradicate evil. That's been the dominant view for the late 19th, 20th and the 21st century. The problem is that we in contemporary Western society, when we reject the biblical worldview, we also get rid of how do we deal with it? Because wouldn't you agree 
that while we have greater advances in medicine, science, education, and government than ever before in human history, we can't stop doing terrible things to each other. From the Holocaust in Nazi Germany, to the genocide in Rwanda, to suicide bombings, to school shootings, it, we just can't seem to fix that by our own efforts. A couple years ago, I read a book by Romeo Delare called Shake Hands with the Devil. Delare was the UN security general in charge of the security forces in Rwanda during the genocide. He was in charge. And he's written this book chronicling just the atrocities, the horrific ethnic cleansing and genocide that happened and how horrible it really was. And what struck me and what he was really saying was the inability of the world's leaders to face it. We just couldn't bring ourselves to acknowledge this was really happening. That a whole race of people is being wiped out. We couldn't bring ourselves to face the reality of the evil. So many times, as he writes this book, there were opportunities to stop it, but we wouldn't do what was necessary. And his own personal journey of deep, crushing guilt, trying to take his life and then finding redemption in Jesus. It's not an easy read, and not a comfortable read, but it's worth it. But his point is, evil's real. And we can't seem to be, bring ourselves to face it. In, in fact, I've, I've read, and perhaps you've read this as well, that in these days, it's not uncommon for those who maybe are critics of Christianity, sometimes referred to as the new atheists, to, to, to make this postulation that, what, you know, the, um, that religion in general, and religious fanatics particularly, have been responsible for a lot of the evil in the world. That religion's part of the problem. Have you heard this? Religion really is part of the issue because people do terrible things in the name of God. Now, uh, in, in fact, Christopher, the late Christopher Hitchens, who was an atheist who wrote this book called God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. I read his book. He's got a whole chapter devoted to this issue. And he cites things like the Spanish Inquisition, the Salem Witch Trials, and the Holy Land Crusades. And we cannot ignore or deny that human beings have, in the name of religion, done terrible things. But if you just take those three, the big three, right? Salem Witch Trials, most historians tell us between 50 and 75 uh, people executed. Terrible. The Spanish Inquisition, somewhere between two and 3,000 people executed. Again, terrible. The Holy Land Crusades, between 1 and 1 1.2 million people total died. Christian and Muslim, peasant and wealthy. Terrible. Let's just round up and say 1.4 total million in those three, which is awful. If you took Hitler, Stalin, and Mao, three of the iconic, terrible, atheistic dictators in, our, in world history, the total death toll for those three is over 100 million. Unthinkable. What's my point? Evil is not a uniquely religious problem. Evil is a human problem. It's our issue. And there's something and someone behind it all. Look at verse 12 again, six, chapter 6, verse 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now, there's debate among New Testament scholars, okay, what's Paul talking about? Is he talking about actual uh, demonic intelligences, pe like personal evil? Or is, he, is this like a, a, a metaphorical way of talking about the corrupt institutions of our world, like, like evil governments? Both. But what he's ultimately saying is, when you find evil at work in government institutions, in people's lives, there is one who's behind that. This brings us to our ruthless enemy. Our, we have a real enemy. We have a real battle, and it's not the one you think. And we have a real enemy. And it's not the one you often think. If I were to ask the average person today, what do you, tell me about, what do you think of Satan? <laughs> I think the answers generally range from the absurd and ridiculous to like the abstract, right? Like the guy with the pitchfork in the ears, or the horns, tail, whispering things on your shoulder, do bad things, you know? The cartoon diversion. Or, you know, it, it, come on, there's no real devil. That's just the ancient Bible language for bad things happen. But in verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, that you may put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
Let me, I, I know that some of you, this kind of talk makes some of us uncomfortable. But let me just tell you, as simply and directly as I can say it, Satan is real. And he is against everything good that God wants to do in your own heart and in this world. There, there is a real enemy. And it's not out there. Them. It's not the Democrats. It's not the Republicans. It's not those that, 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 are, that have different economic views or, than you. It's the enemy of God, who if you belong to him, is your enemy too. And he opposes you because you stand with the one who he hates. How many of you have seen the movie Amadeus? Anyone seen that? If not, it's, it's worth, worth watching. Amadeus is the title of the movie about the life of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, arguably the greatest musical mind that's ever lived. And Mozart was not a moral guy. <laughs> he was a womanizer, a drunkard, and a carouser, and, and, and immature, but he was uh, astronomically gifted. And the character in the movie is a guy named Salieri. He's an Italian composer, and Salieri resents Mozart's gifts. And Salieri actually has this prayer he prays in the movie, God, if you would give me gifts and make me famous, I would use my fame and gifts to serve you and make you famous. And then one night he reads this first draft, no corrections, composition of Mozart. And it's just pure genius, and he can't believe it. And he tosses it aside, and he's shaking with rage. And he goes into his room, and he grabs a crucifix off the wall, and he throws it in the fireplace in his room. And here's a quote from what he says in the movie. He says, from now on, speaking to God, he says, you and I are enemies, because you have chosen as your instrument a boastful, lustful, infantile boy. Because you are unjust, I will block you. I swear it. I will hinder and harm your creature on earth as far as I'm able. That's a perfect description of the attitude of Satan. I, I'm, a, I'm opposed to you, God. I will hinder and harm your servants on earth as far as I'm able. I want to block what you're doing in their hearts and in the world. God opposes. Satan opposes God. And if you belong to God, he opposes you. And you need to know that. The apostle, or, uh, Peter writes in his letter, 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, he says, you know, be sober-minded and watchful because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, we don't know everything that, about Satan. We do know a few things. The Bible gives us some clarity. In Revelation 12, he's called the accuser, meaning he accuses you before God and he accuses God in your own heart. Calls into question the goodness of God. First Thessalonians tells us he's the tempter. Revelation 20, he's the deceiver. John 8, he's the father of lies. And 2 Corinthians 4, he's the God of this age. But what does all this talk about evil and the devil have to do with you? What does it, what does it have to do with you in your life? Satan is far more subtle or crafty, uh, deceptive than like Hollywood would have us believe. He doesn't come to you like a, a killer zombie, you know, do bad things. That's not how it works. He, he, he's much more deceptive than that. It's not, the battle's not so much to get you to do terrible, terrible things, although he'd be happy if you did. It's to get you to start distrusting, disbelieving, to stop focusing on who Christ is and what his will is for your life. He specializes in twisting the truth, sprinkling just enough truth in with the lies so that you, you swallow it. You begin to believe it. Let's just take Ephesians for a minute. If you've been with us, we've looked at all the things in the first three chapters that God has said in Christ are true about us when we trust Jesus. The remarkable, life-changing truths. I want you to see this chart here. It shows that in, in Ephesians 1 verse 5, God has predestined us to be adopted, meaning we're called his sons and daughters, adopted to his family, Satan will tell you in your heart, you're illegitimate children. You don't really belong to him. We're told that he seals us with the Holy Spirit, meaning that our inheritance is guaranteed because of the Holy Spirit. He will tell you, you have no inheritance. Can't trust it. We're told that we're saved by grace and not by works. Satan will say, no, no, you've got to earn this. Nothing's free in this life. We're told that he destroys the dividing wall of hostility. God, God, by his grace, does. So we were reconciled to him and to each other. And Satan's building walls all the time in our own hearts between us and God and between us and each other. Go right on down the list. That we're given access, Satan says, no, no, you don't. You're, you're closed out. You're shut out. That we're given unity of the Spirit, he's sowing disunity and distrust and division all the time. 
that we're given a new self in righteousness and holiness, and Satan is saying, let's go back to the old self, the corrupt one, over and over again. This is a helpful way for, I, spiritual warfare is far more about this than it is losing money in the stock market or a tough circumstance in your life. It's about getting you to disbelieve what God has said is true about you in Christ. And if he can do that, then he'll call, you, he'll call into question all manner of things. He can't have your soul, you belong to Jesus. If you've trusted in, in God, in, in his grace through Christ, you belong to him. He can't have you eternally, but he can keep you ineffective and make you miserable in this life. That's the primary place of spiritual warfare. I think what's happening sometimes in the church, for many of us, is we're so excited to go out there and do things, but we're not fighting the battle in here. We're ineffective out there because we don't really, we're not really rooted and established and grounded in the truth of who he said we are. Anything he can do to stop us from trusting in God or take our focus off of Christ and the gospel. Now I'm gonna ask you a question. If you were Satan, How's that for a start to a question? <laughs> if it's true that he wants to oppose what God wants to do in your life, you know yourself pretty well. Where would you attack you? Where would you come after you? So for some of you, it's shame in the past. The lie he's telling you is you cannot be forgiven again. That thing that you don't talk about, that, that is unforgivable. For some of you, it's bitterness and anger over something done to you. And he's telling you this lie. If God were really good, he wouldn't have let that happen. Where was he? Some of you, it's self-doubt. I'm going to ask you the question. If you were going to sort of sideline yourself, where would you come after yourself? What lie would you tell yourself? What lie are you believing? So we're, we're in a real battle. Thomas Brooks, uh, Brooks, an old Puritan pastor, wrote a book called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. The Puritans were terrible at titling things, but they write, wrote really good stuff. <laughs> Let me just read a couple of these because they're, they're so timely and relevant. He, he, here's how he says some of Satan's devices. In, in presenting the bait and hiding the hook, by painting sin with virtue's colors, by representing to the soul the outward mercies enjoyed by men walking in sin, making it look like it's, those guys aren't following Jesus, they're doing fine. By persuading the soul that repentance is easy and therefore the soul need not scruple about sinning. That's an old Puritan way of saying, you can always ask for forgiveness later. By causing saints to remember their sins more than their Savior. This goes right on down the list. So we're in a real battle and we face a ruthless enemy and the truth of the matter is you are totally unequipped to face him on your own. This brings us to our ready defense. In verse 10, he says, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. In verse 11, he says, put on the armor of God. In verse 13, take up the whole armor of God, meaning God's not left you defenseless. There's a real battle. There's a real enemy, but you're not left on your own defenseless. It's, it's his armor, and it's his strength. Now, I, I could, um, we could literally spend a week or more on each one of these pieces of armor. There are six listed. We don't have that kind of time um, this morning or, you know, in the series. So what I thought I would do, and I mentioned this uh, last hour sort of on a whim, and I was told afterwards we can do this, is that I would send out through our app uh, little devotionals on each piece of the armor this week that you could get because we just don't have time to cover it all. But I want to just go through it kind of briefly. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, uh, using the similar imagery here about our battle. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds, he says. This is really important. First thing he says, having fastened on the belt of truth, now, I borrowed this from a friend of mine who's a pastor. He had it made a, 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 a replica, authentic replica of second century Roman armor. And I tried it on, but Romans were smaller than I am now. So it doesn't really fit me. <laughs> I couldn't get the breastplate off. It would, you'd like to see that, wouldn't you? Anyway, and my head is too big. So anyway, 
Uh, he says, the belt of truth. Now, in the Roman uh, times, the belt was not like a belt that I'm wearing. It was a big, wide leather uh, uh, belt that hold, held the tunic together underneath and held the sword. In other words, it, it held the whole thing together. The breastplate would be fastened to it underneath as were the, 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 the breeches and the greaves. And so the whole thing was clipped to this belt. The point is, everything holds together in the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Jesus, in the truth of who he is and his gospel, holds it all together. And, and Paul says, having put on the belt of truth. And then in the same verse, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate, right? Covers your heart. Protects your heart. Proverbs 4 tells us, guard the heart is the wellspring of life. And it's his righteousness. So what guards my heart is not my righteous good deeds. What I've done. What guards my heart is the righteousness of Christ. That's the gospel. If Satan comes to me and says, Jeff, you're a loser, the truth is, I kind of am. But he's not, and I'm clothed in Christ. If I'm only putting on my righteousness, then he's got every right to attack me, and he'd be right. But I'm covered in his righteousness, and that protects my heart. And notice he said, having put on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, meaning it's already happened. If you trusted in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, this has happened. You need to know that. Then he, he talks about the, the gospel shoes of peace. Last hour I put the sword in the wrong place and it fell down and it was terrifying. The gospel shoes of peace. In the, in the Roman world, Roman soldiers wore sandals, not, not, not like flip-flops like you think of Jesus wearing, but like thick-soled leather sandals that strapped halfway up the calf and they drove nails to the top of those sandals and bent them over on the bottom, poking out, like ancient cleats, basically. They had these hobnailed sandals. And the reason they did this is battlefields got muddy and bloody, and it was so they could dig in and hold their ground. Notice how many times in verse 10 through 14 it says stand. Stand your ground. Stand against the evil one. Withstand his attacks. Stand, stand, stand. Why? Hold your ground. Don't give way. And the gospel shoes of peace means the peace of Christ that causes me not to run, not to collapse, that I can stand in. Then he, then he says the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. The, this this uh, replica here, the, sh the Roman shields were about four feet long. And they would hold them and they would make uh, the shield wall, the uh, tetulus, which is the, it's, uh, it's where we get our word tortoise from, it, because they would make like a, a defensive structure forward and on top that was like a tortoise shell. Impenetrable. Imagine this, thousands of soldiers with these shields on top and the bottom with the lances coming at you. Just advancing, advancing, advancing. When Paul says, take up the shield of faith, now he knew about Roman armor. He says, I'm an ambassador in change, meaning he's chained to a Roman guard day and night. He's seen Roman armor. The, the shield of faith, uh, the image I want you to have in your mind is this. Moms and dads, sons and daughters, men and women, brothers and sisters, your faith in Christ, which is a gift that God gives you, your faith in God, however feeble you might think it is, when you put it into action, when you trust him, when you step out in faith, even the smallest way, and you see him faithful, it grows. It grows. And when it grows, your faith becomes a protective covering over your life and over your family. It, literally a shield for your children, for your heart, for your life. God gives faith when we Walk in faith, our faith grows. Our shield grows, in other words. Because he says it's to extinguish the darts of the enemy. Flaming darts. The attacks. Then he talks about the helmet of salvation. This protects your head. What's this imagery there for? Remember in verse 23 of chapter 4 in Ephesians, we are renewed in the spirit of our minds, or Romans 12, verse 1, transformed by the renewing of your mind, meaning what goes in here, how you think, impacts how you live. The, the assurance of salvation, the absolute certainty that you belong to God through Christ, that you're his and nothing could take that away. The confidence you have, not in yourself, but on who he is and what he's done. Put that on, right? Isn't that a good image? Put that on your head. Think that way. Some of you are suffering from, you need to fill your mind with other things. You've got the wrong thoughts. Put on the helmet of salvation. Notice that he pairs the helmet of salvation in verse 17 with the sword of the Spirit. 
this is the only offensive weapon in the armor. A friend of mine said, no, no, you could kill somebody with a shield. I'm like, well, that's not the point, but maybe. <laughs> weird, you're weird. You know, like, his point is that everything else is about defending ourselves, but the sword is an offensive weapon. The sp- sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It's able to divide the thoughts and intentions of men and lay us open to the very soul. The Word of God. You know the story of Jesus in the wilderness, right? When his very real and ruthless enemy, Satan, comes to tempt him and test him, how does he respond? Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds in the mouth of God. Now, if Jesus needed the word of God to defend himself against the attacks of Satan, you think you're going to do okay without it? Friends, you need God's word in your life. You need it so much more than you think you do. You need more of it than you're getting on Sunday morning for the hour at a sermon. You need more than a tweet a, a, a day or a week. You need to be in the Word of God. I think many of us, the, the church today, we suffer from a lack of a knowledge of who God is. And, and that's because we suffer from a lack of His Word. We have more Bible production than ever before in human history. You can get online right now and look at any version you want. You can order with a click of a button. It'll be at your house on Tuesday. Any book of the Bible you want. But so few of us really know it. When my boys were little, I used to have them recite Psalm 119, 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let me just ask you, what scripture are you committing to memory? What part of God's word to do battle with? When, he, when this evil one lies to you and says you're not worthy, he can't use you, you can't be forgiven, they don't know what you're really like. You don't think I have those thoughts? Standing up here, who am I to preach? If they knew, they wouldn't listen. But you don't know, and you do listen. <laughs> Sometimes. The point is that I'm not worthy, and neither are you, but he is, our God is. You need the word of God in your life. Because there are so many other voices telling you the opposite. Paul's saying, there's a very real battle. It's not what you think. There's a very real enemy. And you ignore him at your peril. But you're not left defenseless. Last. Well, let me just, just this week, about the word of God for a minute. Just, just this week, I texted a, a, a man who's uh, uh, become a friend of mine. Our sons played football together in college, and his son is facing a trial coming up, and there's a lot of injustice going on, and they're really struggling, and I'd heard about it, and I hadn't talked to him in a while, and I just sent him a text. You know what I sent him? Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I just sent that text to him, said, I'm praying for you. He texted me back and said, you have no idea what that meant to me. I didn't know. He said, that's exactly what I needed because we're really weary. He says, I copied it. I put it on my, on, on, on my desk. I sent it to my wife, sent it to my son. This is what we needed. It wasn't my word. It was the word of God. It's just the right moment to remind him. Last, our secret weapon. Notice how this passage ends, which is so profound. I don't know if I paid attention to this, the power of this before. In verse 18 through 20, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that the words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. It's no accident that Paul finishes this description of the armor of God with talking about prayer. It's not actually listed as a piece of armor. But uh, Thomas Brooks in his book, Satan, The Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, he says prayer is the way we activate God's armor. It's the way you put it on. How do you put on the shield of faith? You pray. How do you put on the helmet of salvation? You pray, God, remind me of who I am in you. How do you take out the sword of the Spirit? You pray the word of God. I think it's very powerful for you and for me that this whole passage ends with saying, get in the word of God and pray. Like the the foundational stuff for your life. Get in the truth of God's word and talk to the God who loves you through prayer. You're defenseless without that. You're a sitting duck. You have a real battle. And our our we're, we have a bunch of Christians in the world fighting the wrong battles. Angry, protesting, fighting stuff, but they're 
That's not the primary battlefield. The primary battlefield is for you to believe deep in your mind and heart that you are who God says you are in Christ. Then you're ready to go make a difference in the world with love and with peace and grace and seek justice. I want to urge you. You know, there's a lot coming up. You've got busy weeks coming up. To take seriously this call. Paul says, if you're serious about following my son, following the son of God, Jesus, you are in a battle. And you do face an enemy who is against you. So put on the armor of God, which he's given you in Christ. Get in his word. Get on your knees. Then you'll be able to stand. Let's pray. Father, we, we acknowledge that we live our lives pretty ignorant, really, of the spiritual realities around us. That there really are forces at work in the world. And that, that we do have an enemy, and he's your enemy. But we praise you that your word tells us that greater is the one who's in us than the one who's in the world. We don't have to cower in fear or tremble that the victory is already yours. And you, you've called us not just to hang on or just to huddle up and take it until heaven comes. But you've called us to be on the battlefield, the spiritual battlefield, for your sake. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are, the way you conquer is by giving your life. Help us to surrender our lives to you. We pray in your name. Amen.